The first thing that I would like to do is to let you know who's been behind all this program, and I, I know you will join with me in my thanks to the staff of the Continuing Legal Education Department, uh, directed by George Collins Williams. First person I would like to thank, and she will come in in a moment if I can catch her, is Ruth Windler. I'll get her in a secchi, who is the coordinator. And we have had three technicians. We've had Ken Peterson, we've had Joni, and tonight we have Renee Bayergeon. Our printer, our long-suffering printer, who has put all this together under some of the most frightful conditions, is Nice Bill Henshaw. Also upstairs in the office, we've had Nancy Salzman and Sandy Dixon and Linda Laurie, and we're very grateful for the help that they have all given us. Now, I'm, I'm going to find Ruth Windler for you, just so you can see who she is. She's shy. Oh, there you are. This is Ruth Windler. Thank you very much, Ruth. Now, tonight you finally got that famous table of contents, and we'll just run through it briefly to make sure that you and I are sure that we're all talking about the same thing. Your um, lectures number one, case law with Brian Bucknell, record recordkeeping and billing. At the end of that one, you can put in the two extra pages that you got from Alan Marshall, a practice advisory service. What your client should know and what is a survey. At the end of the survey, you can put your two Spate surveys, Spate Van Austin surveys, the long one, which is the way it should be, and the short one, which is the one that Mrs. Setterington showed us the way it would have been 20 years ago. You can put those facing one another so that you can see the differences and why we don't use a 20-year-old survey anymore. The next thing that I want to draw to your attention under title searches, Tony Peckham's um, searches other than title, there is an additional page in there. It's called 817. And I have to apologize for the provincial reference I made on page H12 to in rural areas we search personal property security. It's any area other than Toronto we search personal property security right in the registry office. That shows how much I know about outside Toronto. You will have the additional eight page H17, that's the, uh, the uh, letter with respect to uh, rent review. The letter itself comes later. Next thing to draw to your attention is the page 34 in your workbook. You should have the, the completed uh, chart for taxes. And page 35, the addresses, we amended the one for Whitby. Page 80A in your workbook, which is the second half, is the additional letter that Tony Peckham gave us. And I'd like to draw your attention to page 85, which is the amortization schedule for the city purchase, the mortgage given back. We're going to talk about it very shortly. You'll notice that where it says amount, we have $40,537.14. If you look across the page at page 84, you'll see that we did the amortization schedule for a mortgage of 41000 even. That's because it's more practical to do it that way. Pat Drozdowski followed the agreement perfectly, and she came to this figure of $40,537.14, so that's how she did her amortization schedule. The interesting thing about that one you'll find on page 86, because as it happens, her payment didn't quite cover the principal and interest. That's because she used a different uh, set of amortization tables. So to start off, this uh, poor little person here is $5.61 in arrears, and by the time he gets down to payment 60, he's $12 in arrears. That's just from the uh, difference in calculations in two amortization schedule books. Next thing to draw to your attention in the table of contents, someone asked me on page 202, which is one of the reporting letters. Um, just a minute now, I look at page 202. I'm 
Now that's page 228. Page 228 starts with a heading, the Family Law Reform Act, 1978, and then unfortunately it starts quite abruptly with your enclosures. There is a little space in there for you to write whatever you want that's applicable in that particular reporting letter to the Family Law Reform Act, and I'm sorry that we just didn't get it dropped down correctly. It isn't that you, that the Family Law Reform Act is one of your enclosures or that you don't write anything about the Family Law Reform Act. I have to apologize for that. I would like to draw to your attention the reference material. It's on the, at the very beginning of your book, on the, the page numbered Roman numeral five. Some of you tell me that you've never seen this little municipal directory, which is the book that tells you all about where to apply for whatever it is, tax certificates and so on, in, in the uh, districts and counties and so on. It also tells you whether you're dealing with a town or a township or an improvement district, or a village, or whatever. That's obtainable from the, the uh, government bookstore. This volume was the $2 volume. I suppose it's five by now. The land registrar's bulletins that we've been referring to are identified on page Roman numeral six, that's the following page, reference number 18. Those are very helpful because those bulletins are what make the land registrar refuse you a registration or grant you a registration if you can give the registrar the right bulletin. And some of you have told me that your registrars are quite sticky unless you produce the bulletin. Particularly when we're talking about the description rather than writing a land title's description all out again, you can just simply say, if it is the case, the whole of parcel, whatever that parcel may be. Your evaluation forms, I think you have a green form for evaluation. Perhaps it'd all be good enough to complete them as we're speaking. Could we perhaps have, yeah, a little piece here. If you'd be kind enough to fill out your evaluation, and if you didn't get one, there's some extras here. It would be very helpful to Ruth and her staff if they knew how you feel about what you've heard. Have you heard what you wanted to hear? Have you heard what you thought you were going to hear? Are there other things that you think you need to hear? Uh, is there a, some of you have been kind enough to suggest that this time is too early, or this time is too late, or whatever. That's, it's all very helpful. Now, I'd like to dwell, if I could please, on the material that you got this evening, and I just want to draw to your attention some of the things that we would have gone over last week had we had a moment. The material you got this evening starts with the memo to close that rural sale, page 257. And on page 258, you will see that the statement of adjustments has been worked out for this particular transaction. A very simple statement of adjustments. You get your facts from the agreement of purchase and sale, and the only adjustment in this particular case was the taxes. You will have the figure from your tax department on receipt of your tax certificate following your letter. And you'll notice that the vendor pays up to an exclusive of the closing day, and the purchaser picks up from closing day. On page 259, your executor's deed, you'll notice that Pat Drozdowski was talking last week about whether this was for the payment of debts or not. She has included in her deed that this is for the purpose of administering the state, but not for the purpose of paying debts. And the reason for that is because if it were for the purpose of paying debts, the executors would then be obliged to give their own affidavit with respect to legal age and marital status. And I know you know now, though there were some people who were at the, at the first confused, it is not the marital status of the deceased, because once the deceased dies, there is no marriage, and we don't have to worry about a spouse having a possessory right. The spouse may have other rights, but not a possessory right. So it's the affidavit of the executors they're talking about. Don't ask me why, that's just section 4210 of the Registry Act. The next thing I'd like to draw to your attention is on page 260. And that is the kind of description the registry office wants you to use if you have land that is identified as a part on an R plan. 
It isn't a lot on a registered plan, it's a piece usually of a lot on a registered plan or of a township lot, and it saves you doing a meets and bounds description, and in fact most registrars will insist on that kind of a, of a uh, reference plan if you have a cumbersome description. Page 262, the affidavit of the executors, is that affidavit which we are required to have in executor's deeds because the recital doesn't make anything happen. A recital is simply a recital. And until we get to 20 years down the line where vendors and purchasers will protect us, we have to have an affidavit confirming that the recitals are true. Again, don't ask me why all these things, I'm only telling you the what. Page 264, the declaration as to possession, that's that gosh awful form. And Pat Drozdowski has been kind enough to draw to your attention in paragraph six. That's the way you can usually tell somebody who has said get me the Declaration of Possession and put John Smith on the top, John Smith on the bottom, and have it ready for closing. That's the one. Paragraph 6 is the one that refers to completely fenced, and most of them, I can assure you, have never been completely fenced. Most properties are not completely fenced anyway. The next thing she's got in there is the uh, bill of sale for you and the undertaking by the vendor. And you'll notice that on page 271, that undertaking of the vendor, the reference that Pat Drozdowski was talking about, where it says to make the balance due on closing, payable as follows to Nancy Drew and Trust, and it didn't say, or as she shall further in writing direct. And you may want, if you're using that for a reference, to put your own little PS, if you think it necessary, to go on and do that. The rest of that document follows fairly well. You will know, uh, notice on page 274, this is where most people get caught in their affidavit of land transfer tax. If they have chattels, the chattels and the land and building must add up to your purchase price. Is there a problem over there? Something you haven't got? Page 277, the payment clause in the mortgage. There may be very few of you who do your mortgage just exactly this way. Most of you leave in the line which has been crossed out and the said principal sum of $15,000 shall become due and. I think it's a matter of judgment. I practice chicken law so I do it the other way but this one I think will work. You'll notice also in the paragraph which is the uh, the one after taxes and performance of statute labor and it begins and it is hereby agreed that in case default shall be made there is a space there for filling in you can always tell if somebody knows this mortgage form the two things they miss that's one and that six months corresponds I presume with the gale dates yes it does and the other place people will miss is on in this mortgage it's on page 281 the undersigned mortgage or acknowledges receipt one or the other of those blanks takes an S. The chattel mortgage has been filled out, and you will recall that Pat Drozdowski mentioned that there are time limits with respect to that chattel mortgage, and I would like to draw to your attention that you must have that chattel mortgage signed. It must be a document uh, between the parties before you can do page 287, which is your financing statement. Your financing statement is what goes up to the personal property securities, but it of itself is not a document under the statute of frauds. In fact, the um, debtor doesn't get to sign it at all. At page 289, you'll see what I was talking about earlier with respect to this odd mortgage. This is the one you will recall that there was to be a certain amount of cash paid on closing, $24,000, and the balance was to be found in that second mortgage. If you get a hold of an offer in time, you will try and, and reverse that, make your fluctuating figure, your balance due on closing, rather than the mortgage, because you're likely to know until very close to closing what that figure is going to be. And while the machine can take care of an amortization schedule, it's kind of nutty to have a mortgage of $40,537.14 if you don't have to. 
The existing first mortgage in that particular case, you will see if you want to bother checking back there at page 80 and 81 where the amortization schedules are, I think you'll find that that works out correctly and the interest, as you know, accrues on a daily basis to the day before closing. The rent has been adjusted on a daily basis and there is an allowance for the last month's rent plus the security deposit if there is one. No, that's not right, plus the interest on the last month's rent. We don't have security deposits anymore. It is for your protection to indicate those matters which are usual matters of adjustment for which you are making no adjustment, such as hydro, no adjustment, consumption measured by meter, fuel, no adjustment, premises heated by gas, water, no adjustment, for whatever the reason, insurance, no adjustment. It's much more helpful later on when you want to go back and find out the why if you've already written the why. Now, in the particular case of our friend Peter Black, whose wife Gladys left us in time to go into land titles, when uh, we got the land into land titles uh, by the search, Gladys was gone. For the purposes of conveyancing, we revived, um, or at least we, we, post we accelerated the application because we wanted to show you a survivorship application to draw to your attention that the items that are in the survivorship application are similar to the items that you saw in the executor's deed. You're explaining something, in this case, why Gladys isn't signing. And those are the types of things that would be uh, included in that application. Page 290, page 291. Page 295 reminds me to draw to your attention land titles particularity about names, descriptions, and this one, which is dates. Down at the bottom it says dated the 21st day of February 1981. That's usually the day it was signed. So we are reminded to have our clients uh, complete that if it isn't completed already when they sign it. Because no matter what date you have on the outside of your document, that's the date that land titles will use. And if you're making reference to any land titles document and you're trying to st state its date, that's the place that you'll be looking for it. We have, again, this undertaking, page 299. It's a standard undertaking. Sometimes you will find that if the vendor's solicitor is the recipient, the payee of the balance due on closing, he will be asked to give undertakings with respect to the disposition of those funds. The direction to and the acknowledgement of the tenant, and I notice there's a little typo in your um, table of contents, page 301. If you put them on the same page, it's very difficult for the tenant to indicate that he wasn't aware. It's also very difficult for the tenant to indicate that those, in fact, were not the terms of his tenancy. And this is usually, uh, it makes reference to the terms of the tenancy in um, tenancy where there is no written lease. The last thing I wanted to draw to your attention with respect to these forms, all of which relate to the transactions we've been talking about, is on page 307. And you'll notice that in this particular case, we don't have an interest adjustment date, but we do have that amortized clause. I guess the trickiest part of putting a mortgage together is the payment clause. And the amortization payment clause is difficult if we have um, an interest adjustment date. That's the date at which we tidy up the interest if there have been advances before the date where you want, the, to, want to be the operative date. That would be, say, the first of a month or the last of a month, or if it's been a building mortgage with advances along the way. You tidy up the interest on a, a date that's called the interest adjustment date, and if you divide your year into any 12 months, the interest adjustment date falls on month 12, your first regular payment falls on month 1, your last regular payment falls on month 11, and your completion payment or your balloon payment or your final payment, whatever you call it, falls on a month 12. And so if you keep those little things uh, in mind, you won't have any trouble getting the payment clause correct. You will see there that we start from the 17th of March and our first payment date is the 1st of April. Our next to last payment is in a February and our final payment is in a March. So we've made the circuit. And again, you'll notice somebody was smart enough to put in the six months in there for your compounding.
and those forms may be of some help to you. They will serve as a checklist for you of the things that we have been talking about in connection this, with this transaction. I guess now is the time to remind you that someplace along the line we all got one of these, their lawyers' errors and omissions, and in this they have identified areas of problem and particularly the areas of problems in um, dealing with land transactions. So if you haven't lost it entirely, uh, you might want to review it at your convenience. The next thing that I want to talk to you about is the use of your uh, office staff. Way back at uh, page 12 in your workbook, you will see a little comment on the assistance of secretaries and paralegals. This is the part that's identified in the um, flyer as what uh, your secretary should not do. The Law Society is taking a dimmer and dimmer view of those who try and practice law through their secretaries. Not to say that most of them couldn't practice this pretty good law, but it's, it's still the solicitor's responsibility. The buck stops with the solicitor. So that if you are getting into a situation where you haven't enough time and you want to rely on some assistance, you are still obliged to take full responsibility for the assistance that you hire. That means that if they are not already qualified through some official course, it's up to you to see that they are trained and that they are supervised, that they know the parameters within which they must operate and the things that they must not do, and you must do this kind of thing, we must do this th kind of thing, on a continuing basis. Afford your paralegal the opportunity for further education, for uh, 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 practice w within your office of the things that that paralegal can do. Those of you who are members of the Canadian Bar probably found some uh, assistance in the most recent issue of the National. There are two comments in there on paralegals and legal assistance, one of them by Mr. Jessamon, who uh, for a time ran, I guess, the most office, efficient office in Canada. He managed to get his entire billable day's work done by noon, and then he said he had the afternoon to do the things that he wanted to do and go on his boards and his causes and so on. And I'd just like to quote to you briefly from a report that was made for the real property section of the Canadian Bar a couple of years ago dealing with paraprofessional assistance. And one of the things that it draws to our attention that is in real estate transactions, not only are we uh, likely to benefit from the help of paralegal assistances, but we perhaps should make it our business to acquire paralegal help because paralegal help can do things for the client that uh, can be done uh, equally effectively but perhaps not so expensively and your client is getting the same level of service but is saving money. And the key question is, does one have to be a solicitor to do this particular thing? A solicitor is uh, certainly responsible for checking over a search of title. A solicitor is responsible for the requisitions. A solicitor is responsible for the answers to the requisitions. A solicitor is responsible for the giving of advice to the client. A solicitor is responsible for the report and the bill. But there are many things that the paralegals can do. They can do the search and they can prepare the abstract for your review. They can go and do a variety of other searches, such as searches in the sheriff's office or the corporation searches or the kinds of searches that you have through taxes, water, and so on. Uh, if there is such a thing as an average closing, paralegal is perfectly capable of handling that, particularly if the solicitor has gone over the file and completed the kind of memo that Mrs. Drozdowski suggested for us. It's quite possible for your paralegal to prepare the kind of correspondence you are going to need for your signature and to prepare most of the documents. The only documents that would require help were documents that have some kind of a curve, some extra special problem with respect to names or uh, descriptions or something. The paralegal can be a source of information of the kinds of things that are included in that municipal directory. Um, who do you ask in this particular case or uh, what kind of uh, service are you going to get when you write to such and such a place for taxes or public health or fire, whatever it may be. And a paralegal 
who has been well-trained has an overview of your file and can help you to see where the problem areas are in your file so that you can devote uh, your time to the areas that are critical. And certainly the drafts of reports and so on can be repaired by your, prepared by your paralegals because they know as well as you do what has gone on in the file. The one thing to watch, of course, is that if your paralegal establishes a relationship with the client, that you don't find the client trying to extract legal uh, opinions from your paralegal help. And with the assistance of highly qualified paralegal help, we can accomplish a lot more a lot faster. And while we are professionals and we are interested in service, most of us have to live and we also have to pay our rent. And so if you can do more, better, faster, and cheaper, there's a little left over after you've paid the rent. Now, I don't think there's anything else that uh, I can tell you at the moment with respect to those areas. Some of you have asked questions, which I will deal with at the end if we have time, because they rather trespass on Miles O'Reilly's territory. And I think, let's see what time we're at. I think what we will do is introduce Miles O'Reilly, who's going to deal with the deal that didn't, or the deal that mightn't, or the deal that has trouble getting uh, closed. And uh, we'll see how much time we have at the end. Now, Miles O'Reilly has to be the only person I know who gives you a CV with a picture on. Isn't that nice? But in spite of it being not, as, not nearly as handsome as uh, you, Miles, uh, it does tell me helpful things, such as he was called in 1963. Well, I know that. He was a classmate of mine. He went to Osgoode Hall Law School, which is why I didn't meet him until we were called to the bar. He's been most active in the practice of law, particularly in the area of people who have problems, such as bankruptcy and executions and so on. He has lectured in the bar admission course, and he's been a group instructor. And while his big thing is bankruptcy and insolvency, let's hope that while he's, when he's finished with this transaction for us, he hasn't led this poor creature into bankruptcy. Miles O'Reilly. Well, I noted at one point it was suggested that this was to do with remedies. And I'm sure any of you have had to recommend that uh, clients get into any lawsuits. As far as they're concerned, that is the last thing on their mind by way of a remedy. It's usually more of an illness than that. I dare say that most of the people that are attending the last uh, weeks of the session have been spending most of their time in conveyancing and real estate, although I certainly see a few general practitioners that do everything. But by and large, conveyancers don't want to have anything to do with the courts. I'm not trying to steer you away from the courts, but uh, it doesn't do too many people any good. However, one of the areas in which solicitors commonly attend in court are on vendor and purchaser applications. I really want to reassure you that there is no mystique in the litigation process of a vendor and purchaser application. And I dare say at some point during your practice you will all attend on very many of them as counsel. What is a vendor and purchaser application? There is a fair bit of confusion as to what the courts can do in connection with a vendor and purchaser application as opposed to, say, specific performance. Basically, it is to resolve requisitions that are on title. Now, it may not solve all of the requisitions on title. It may not be able to determine rights of uh, a mortgagee. It may not resolve some of the bigger issues involving third parties. But what it does resolve is as to whether or not a purchaser has to accept the title subject to the requisition he has submitted. Regardless of whether eventually the, the title is proven to be clear, it will permit a purchaser to get out of a transaction and not be buying a lawsuit. At the end of the lecture, I'm going to refer you to a case in which that happened. The vendor and purchaser application was 
successful from the purchaser's point of view and they got out of the transaction, although it was subsequently shown that the requisition had been satisfied by clearing the cloud from title. But uh, it was a very complicated matter, and I'll go into that at the very end. The authority for a vendors and purchasers application comes, strangely enough, under the Vendors and Purchasers Act. Section 3 provides that an application may be brought in respect of any requisition or objection or claim for compensation or any other question arising out of or connected with the contract except a question affecting the existence or validity of the contract. Now that's the plain reading of the section. I would hasten to point out that really the Vendors and Purchasers Act is to handle requisitions that have been made on title. And if it gets any more complex than that, the court is going to say, I'm sorry, we're not going to solve that problem here. You'll have to go elsewhere. Another major point to be noted is that an application can only be made by either the vendor or the purchaser, not a third party. So it only resolves problems between the two and it only binds those two. Like any lawsuit, you can only bind the parties that are to it. But there is provision to bring another party into the action if it is clear that they are going to be involved. Just for example, there is a recent case you may have seen involving the Canada Trust and MICC. This was a case where the mortgagee was exercising a power of sale and he had a builder's mortgage. This was a mortgage that uh, went on the land uh, when construction was started and advances were made while construction was going on. All of the mortgage advances had been made before the mortgagee received any notice that a lien was claimed or before the registration of a lien. The mortgage went into default and the mortgagee wanted to sell the property. And the requisition that was raised was that the mechanics lien claimants who in their action were claiming priority over the advances of the mortgagee could sell the land in their mechanics lien action which would take place sometime after the closing. So they were faced with this problem. Does the purchaser have to accept the title and then possibly face an action by the mechanics lien holders? This was brought on a vendor and purchaser application and the judge held that the mechanics lien act did not apply but the Mortgages Act giving the power of sale and which purports to give title to a party if they get the required statutory declaration would override any claims that a mechanics lien holder would have. Now one of the things that was done in this application was that the mechanics lien holders were given notice as they would be required to otherwise they would not be bound by the finding of the court. In that case, uh, they certainly showed what the problem was uh, by quoting from Macklem and Bristow that in effect gave a contrary opinion to the way the court ruled. And I must say I was a little shocked when somebody uh, asked me a year ago for virtually an identical opinion and uh, I came down the same way Macklin and Bristow did, said, well, you'd be unwise to accept title under that situation, and then we find a year later the court goes the other way. This does provide a quick way of disposing of the matter, and that's what's really important about a vendor and purchaser application. It has to be handled very quickly. Now the proceedings can be taken in both the Supreme Court and the County Court. 
What considerations would you look at for bringing the application in either of the courts? Well, the first one I've mentioned is time. It's exceedingly important that you get this resolved before closing. The county court, generally speaking, is faster in that respect. The Supreme Court, if you want to get a motion set down for a hearing that is going to take more than an hour or two, they won't give you an appointment for two or three months. And even then, it's a, a month if you've got uh, an hour's application to, to argue. So that can cause you a problem if there's no way of putting the closing off. What about convenience? The Supreme Court, of course, sits in Toronto to hear weekly court motions. And it might be more convenient if the solicitors are in Toronto to have the application heard here rather than, say, in Fort Francis, where the property may be located. Conversely, if you are located in Fort Francis, it makes a lot more sense to have the matter determined up there. Complexity. If the issue is a complex one, there is a feeling amongst solicitors that they would prefer to have it heard by a Supreme Court rather than a county court judge. That, to some extent, is insulting the county court bench, whose decisions in this field particularly have stood up very well indeed. But there is still that. Similarly, the precedent aspect of it. There is no question, of course, that as a precedent, it will carry more weight. And that, of course, leads to the, the point of what is the effect of the vendor and purchaser application. It only binds the two people. Is the same subject going to come up again when you come to sell the property? Is it going to be raised again? And if so, what is the effect of the order that you obtain on a vendor and purchaser application? That is one of the considerations for the precedent aspect of it, because all the order is going to do is create a precedent so that you will be able to attend on another vendor and purchaser application if necessary, or you can hopefully convince the purchaser when you come to sell that there is nothing in the requisition on the basis of the previous uh, order that has been made. One thing that does or possibly can tie up the appeal is the fact that you can appeal to a court of appeal and that is going to mean you're not going to be heard there for probably another four to six months. Generally speaking, appeals are not taken from V&P applications for the simple reason that both parties want the deal to go through and they are probably reaching for the same end, and that is to get an order saying that the requisition has been satisfied. But I would caution you, it can't be too friendly, because the order, as I say, only binds the parties to it, and you as a purchaser may find yourself when you come to sell that all the authorities were not canvassed, that uh, the court was not properly uh, instructed in the matter, and when the new purchaser comes along, he'll say, hey, but these cases weren't raised. I think you're dead wrong on this. I think uh, I'm entitled to get out. And if the court is uh, convinced, the purchaser in that case will get out and the vendor will be stuck with his previously uh, bad title, even though the other V&P order gave him some comfort. A matter of costs also is raised in this Quite commonly, you go in and say, oh, well, I don't care about the cost. There'll be no costs. Courts sometimes buy that, and in other times, they don't. If it is a novel point or something which uh, is unusual, they will generally say there'll be no costs. I would have thought that situation would have happened in that Canada Trust and MICC case. But in that case, no. The court said, Declaration sought will be granted. The objection to title is not valid. The application will therefore be granted with costs. So there were costs awarded on that application. What goes in an application? 
Well, just what you would think would go in an application. And if you uh, turn to, what is the page, uh, Miriam? Page 233. Page 233. This is a notice of motion. Now, seven days' notice has to be given with a notice of motion, but in V&P applications, generally, both parties are willing to have the matter heard earlier, and if they can get an earlier appointment uh, with the court, generally, that is done, and nobody worries about the time constraints. You'll see the motion simply sets out as clearly as possible the requisition and the answer to the requisition this, of course, is the first chance the judge gets to see what the problem is, and it should be spelled out as clearly as possible. In support of that application will be the affidavit of the solicitor, or a solicitor. You may want to have someone else in the office if you're going to take the application yourself. And it will simply set out all the salient points. Firstly, the title. Without the title, it's probably pretty hard to understand what the requisition's all about. Secondly, the copy of the agreement of purchase and sale. Then, set out the requisitions that have been raised by the purchaser. And the answer given to them. Now, if there are any other documents that uh, come into play with the requisition, they should also be exhibited so the court has got everything in front of them. In the Supreme Court now, all matters have to be filed with a record, which simply means you copy out the notice of motion and affidavit again and put an index in the front of it. That's really all a record is. In attending in before the court, you will have a number of uh, authorities. In this day and age, the photocopy machine uh, obviates the necessity of having a great slew of books and copies of the cases. The whole case, not just the head note, should be given to the judge. It's quite commonly the head notes are erroneous or you really can't make any sense out of the reasoning from the head note. So the whole case should be before the court. It's also a courtesy, of course, to make sufficient copies for everybody who is concerned with the application. And that, of course, includes the judge. In addition to the Vendor and Purchasers Act, Title problems can also be resolved under the rules of practice under Rule 610 and 611. 610 is a summary procedure for quieting titles without going through all the complexities of the Quieting Titles Act. Uh, it goes, of course, beyond the Vendors and Purchasers uh, Act in that uh, it can actually make declarations as to uh, the status of the documents on title, for example, a uh, uh, mortgage that uh, may have been on title for uh, low these many years that uh, can be declared as uh, discharged or no longer an encumbrance. Under 611, a notice of motion can be brought to determine the rights of a person depending on the construction of a document. Now we come down to the closing. Certainly in your experience, I'm sure you only have one or two deals a year that don't close, but when they don't, what do you do? What do you tell your clients? Let's say it's a house deal. What's going to happen uh, when he's all ready to, to move and he has to sell his own house and he's buying another one and he's not going to get that house? These are very real problems from the point of view of the, the client and they may just be academic exercises for you. 
The first step, as I'm sure you all know, is tender. Why is the first step tender? Well, I guess that's going to depend entirely on what you want to do with the deal or whether you want to get out of the deal or you want to ram it down the other person's throat. Tender is not essential at all times, but it is essential if you want specific performance. And it's generally essential just to show that you have done your job and you are ready, willing, and able to close the transaction. It is a way of perfecting the job that you have been hired to do and preserve whatever rights you may have and let you worry about those rights tomorrow. So generally speaking, I think you would all consider making a tender. It doesn't usually, of course, come as a surprise to you. The deal isn't going through. You sometimes get uh, an inkling that things aren't going right. I had a client just last week that uh, brought in an offer on a Wednesday and I shipped it over to my uh, real estate uh, partner and he says, but this deal is supposed to close on Friday. And I said, well, it's a very, very important uh, land assembly. I don't know what they have done. Uh, they may have a little difficulty, I know, getting uh, the money. They've been consulting me for the last couple of years and they're sort of on the edge of the, the brink. I don't know whether they're going to do it, but the whole thing will fall apart unless you close the deal. And he said, well, I'll see what we can do, but uh, we may just have to rely on uh, beating them on tender and see if they're going to do everything right. He said, well, I haven't even looked at title. So he got somebody out and he looked at the title and he said, aha, there's a mortgage that they have to discharge. We'll see what's going to happen. So sure enough, on the Friday afternoon, they're chasing around and he's finally reached my client who was also scrambling for the money. And as luck would have it, he actually got the money together at 4.15. And the other lawyer is saying, well, I'm all ready to go. He goes over to the registry office and he says, well, what have you got for me? He says, oh, well, I've got a deed here. And uh, I said, yes, and what about a mortgage? Oh, I've got a mortgage statement uh, here and I'll get the mortgage discharged. And he said, oh, no, you haven't got a discharge of the mortgage? Gee, that's too bad. I guess we're going to have to put this off now, aren't we? And they did and they closed later. But <laughs> it sometimes helps tactically to have those uh, things all ready even if you're not going to deliver them. Now how do you make a tender? Let's just try. Miriam, I'm going to close with you and I'm the vendor. So I come up to you and I say, well, we're all set to go here. You got your money. You're not talking to me. That page in the script. <laughs> so I first pull out a mortgage statement. I say, I, I guess, I guess you checked with the first uh, mortgagee to see that my figures are right in the statement of adjustments. Here is a statement from the first mortgagee confirming my figures, the figures in the statement of the adjustments. That's the proper way to do it, is it? What's wrong with the way I've done it? You're trying to get me to lose my rights already, aren't you? <laughs> okay, I'm now looking for, I have to provide you with a mortgage discharge. I say, I've got a mortgage statement from the second mortgagee and I'm going to undertake to obtain and register a discharge after closing. Is that okay? Sorry, I require an executed discharge of that mortgage. Fire insurance. Here's the insurance policy. I couldn't find a transfer form, so you have my authority to transfer the policy on my behalf. Sorry, that won't do. I'm afraid I'll have to have the fire insurance policy and a transfer signed. Preferably, I'll have to have the consent of the insurer as well. Dear me. I fooled him. That wasn't in the script. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, the keys are with the next door neighbors. You know, when we close, I'll call them and tell them to uh, give them to your client. I'm sorry, I have to have a key to one of the doors right now. Well, if you got a check for me, I'll, I'll give you the deed. Uh, I witnessed the execution, so if you'll just swear my affidavit here. I'm sorry, I'm afraid I have to have a deed in registrable form pursuant to the terms of the agreement of 
purchase and sale. Dear me, dear me. Am I in I trouble? <laughs> now, it's not all defects that are going to make an imperfect tender. I would suggest that the courts, to some extent, are lenient in minor matters that do not totally affect the transaction itself. There's no question if you don't have the keys or if you don't have a deed in registrable form that it's going to fall flat. And if you don't have an executed discharge of the mortgage, you're not going to be able to get away with an undertaking. You can't give an undertaking on a tender. Matters of the transfer of the fire insurance are a little dicier. I wouldn't think that a tender would fall flat because of that. Do you have any experience in that, Miriam? It's trying to trap me already. <laughs> Okay, I'm, the, uh, I'm now the, the purchaser, and uh, you're tendering on me. So uh, I, as purchaser, say, you didn't give me a statement of adjustment, so I didn't know how much to make the check out for. Anyway, I've, I've got my trust check here made out to you for what I think is probably more than enough. You can give me back the change later. Uh, it was too late to get the check certified, but the, the funds are in my account. If you don't think it's enough, I've probably got additional cash in my pocket to, to cover. <laughs> so why are we sitting closing <laughs> down to the, what's left of the Severn? Well, I'm uh, sorry, Mr. O'Reilly, but uh, I did give you a statement of adjustments, and uh, I've already forwarded it to you, and I require a certified check, and it has to be in the correct amount and has to be payable to the client, as I indicated. Dear, dear. Life is so difficult in the big city. Now, in tendering, it is generally wise to have a secretary or somebody as a witness present. Uh, I have generally taken a secretary along who is a pretty good uh, stenographer, and she will transcribe word for word the particulars of the tender. Uh, it is probably wise, if you are being tendered on, to keep your mouth shut. Because you may well give away the fact that you were not ready, willing, and able, or some other defect uh, from, from that score. For instance, uh, the tender that uh, was being made the other day, I didn't know whether the money was going to be available or not. So, you know, I instructed the solicitor, I said, for heaven's sake, don't say a thing about the money. Because if he had said, gee, I'm sorry, I don't have the funds here, what are you going to tender on me? Uh, we may have been in a more serious problem than if you just said nothing whatsoever and said, no, you haven't tendered the proper documents. Now, in many circumstances, Tender isn't necessary, nor is it advisable. Firstly, if there's been a repudiation of the contract. And this frequently happens if you tell the other side, gee, my client isn't going to be able to get the funds. He's not going to be able to close with you. That may well be a repudiation of the contract. You tell him you're not going to close. So again, shut up. There's no point in tipping your hand the money may come in within the prescribed period, and then you'd be in a rather embarrassing situation to uh, say, oh, I've got my money together now and I want to close. And the other solicitor may say, well, you repudiated that contract. You told me last week that you weren't going to close, and my client is now resold. Secondly, if the other party is in default of a condition precedent, to closing. If he hasn't complied, then you're entitled to treat it as breached. And thirdly, if tender has been specifically waived, you don't have to tender. And finally, if the other party has indicated by his conduct his inability to complete the contract. 
As I said, if there has been an anticipatory breach, you should accept that breach and make your election of how you're going to go. Because you can get into hot water if you do prefer to go right down the line to the end to uh, affect a tender. Miriam suggesting we have a 10-minute uh, break.